this time. Dude, look at his, look at his whole head open. He's lucky to make it out alive. A mine shaft extraction. So here we go, down in the belly of the boost. Turns deadly as Luke gets jammed up in the hot zone. Whatever you're doing, do it, because I'm nervous. Stop! Ah! And a nighttime boat SOS. Should be uh, swimming in in the dark. In shark infested waters. No, you're going to get bit, you're going to get bit. Backfires. I'm going to fucking stuck you all night. That's what's going to happen. Oh. Hey, JB. Hey, boss. How are you? Yeah, good. I'm just ringing for details on this bike job. Have we got the exact pinpoint? It's about 30 k's west of Kalgoorlie on a mine lease. Team Salvage was heading home to Bustleton from Kalgoorlie. Or at least they thought they were. Ops manager Jacinta is on the phone with an 11th hour fast turnaround search and rescue job. So you guys are going to have to do a bit of scouting. Uh, obviously don't take too much time scouting. All right, so what you're saying is find a mine shaft in Kalgoorlie. <laughs> There's only about a thousand of them, so you'll be fine. In the middle of the desert out here, oh, good luck. It's an insurance job for a dirt bike stuck at the bottom of an abandoned mine shaft in the Kalgoorlie goldfields. The budget for this job is really tight. The bike's worth six grand, which gives us four and a half grand to work with. Our time frame is even tighter. We've got five hours to find the bike, retrieve it and deliver it. The rider is 18 and he ended up with a split open head, which resulted in a brain hemorrhage and a busted up knee. So he got pretty bashed in then. Yeah, he did. And he obviously wants the bike back in one piece. But that's about all of the details I've got at the moment. 18-year-old Mitch was out for a spin on his brand new Suzuki RMZ250 dirt bike, hooning around the Jackson Hole mining lease when he crashed into a mine shaft. Look at the dude. Look at his, look at his whole head open. He's lucky to make it out alive. The $6,000 bike has spent the past three months at the bottom of the mine shaft. Mitch's insurance company is paying to get it out. Dirt bike trap. Yeah. Like a booby trap. Dirt bike booby trap. But, yeah, poor little bastards, you reckon, is pretty hectic. So hence why I've got such a low budget. So there's not a lot of room to move. Basically, we just got to get in, get the job done, get out. Lucky we're in the gold fields doing some other jobs. It'll allow us to squeeze this one in, even though it's a low budget. Problem is, we need to have this all wrapped up this afternoon because we're due back in Bustleton tomorrow. Team Salvage is making the trip in convoy. Crew leader Luke is riding shotgun in the Jeep with Dan. Truck driver Fred is transporting 22-tonne winch beast Christopher on the back of his B-double truck. Fred's a specialist long-haul truck driver. We've used him on this job because it's a long way from home. He's really good to work with, he understands how things move, and he works well with heavy equipment. So, Fred, we're kind of looking for a needle in a haystack, mate. Same <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Jacinda's just got off the phone. She's got a pretty vague area for us to look in. What we'll do is we'll uh, get as close as we can on the tarmac, and then we'll go for unload over. Sounds like a plan. Details of the crash site were provided by Mitch's mother, but they're sketchy. Mitch was in no shape to relay accurate location coordinates. Right, oh Fred, I reckon we're getting close, mate. We might look at pulling up and unloading here, over. No, it's going somewhere hard. This is the 30k mark that Jacinda gave us. Time is money in the salvage game, and four and a half thousand dollars doesn't buy very much of it. The team has to find the crash dirt bike quick smart if they're to make any money. So what we'll do, we'll unload Christopher, I'll get in him and start scouting. You get in the mini me and scout. Got a lot of miles to cover. So I'll talk to you on the radio and we'll just find it. Yep, we'll just yeah, around. Cool. We'll stop and check these little pits and have a look in them, I suppose. Well. The information we got is like next to nothing. Well, they're all here. So we're just going to have to check every pit we come against. Yeah. Every one. It's just going to be a process of elimination. We know it's about 30 k's west of Cal. 
So we're at 30 k's west of Cow. She said it's a, a mining lease. It's a big area to search, so we're better off searching with two vehicles instead of one. When it comes to salvage vehicles, few compare to Christopher, a $400,000 military-grade tank retriever. Christopher was built for the desert, but this mining lease is like a minefield for a 22-tonne recovery truck. There's literally hundreds of holes scattered throughout this area. So we'll go up this track. Just keep your eyes peeled. You're looking for a hole in the ground, over. Yeah, righto. Copy that. <laughs> Yeah, pretty rough. Who's having a good time? We've been mining in Western Australia for 150 years. There is thousands of abandoned mine shafts out here. The ground's unstable, and it's really dangerous to be cruising around out here. Yeah, we've got to be pretty careful here. Like, Christopher's no fucking light foot. He weighs 22 tonne. We've got a lot of old mine shafts, a lot of collateral areas. I kind of want to get close to look, speed up where we're looking, but we definitely don't want to get too close because 22 tonne will tumble down pretty easy. If, we'd, uh, if we go down, I don't think there'd be lots that would get us out. Time is their enemy, and so it's time to start looking in those mine shafts. Pretty much just got to check them all. There's one here, we'll drop and have a quick look at it now. not us. It's probably one of the first hundred we'll be checking today. Let's keep on rolling. Right, oh boys, I'll just check one shaft. No, no banana. Uh, we'll check down this little track here and pull the spear off. Right, oh, we're just going to keep scouting. We've got a lot of ground to cover over. So Jackson Hole mining lease is about 150 hectares which is about 150 football fields. The lease has got more holes than Swiss cheese. That motorbike could be down any one of them shafts. Yeah, look, they're pretty remote right now. It's going to be really hard just to try and find that shaft. I don't like our chances, to be honest. You've been really good to get some coordinates. It's a bit of a mercy mission for us, helping a young fella out, but that's Team Selvage. We're all heart. But the mission is now two hours in, and Luke's no closer to laying eyes on the target. It's going to be pretty time critical, but the last thing I want to be doing is going down a mine shaft in the dark. Can you see anything? Any luck? Any mine shafts? Yeah, we're heading towards the lump of dirt now. We're going to see what it is. Are you declaring an emergency? Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Beely now. Boys, there's just uh, one over on the starboard side of my position now. Do you just want to come over and scout it and I'll keep on hooning ahead over? Yeah, we'll just check this one here. i just check this one we found. Hang on. Before it was shut down in the late 70s, Jackson Hole was producing more than 10,000 ounces of gold a year. That's around $26 million at today's gold price. These days, it's a dirt bike playground. No, look, in Selvage, we rarely get all the facts and figures, so all we've got is a photo of the mine shaft and the photo of what the guy looked like after he came out of it. So, yeah, pretty limited stuff to go off. Deal. No motorcycles in there. No motorcycles in there, eh? <laughs> All right, let's uh, we can go back over and check on that ridge line up the hill there. That's yeah, the let's probably head up that hill. All right. 
halfway into the five hour job and things are looking grim. Team leader Luke is feeling the pressure. I reckon we've probably only got about another 20 minutes of serve time, boys. We're going to have to call this job. Righto, let's have a little sniff up through here. It's a good high spot to look anyway. Yeah, good point. Get a bird's eye view on the ridge. We'll see what's going on over. Yeah, mate. Just sneak through here again. Locating the crashed dirt bike is phase one. They still have to retrieve it before dark. Surveillance from high ground could be the team's best chance of ensuring they get paid. What do you reckon, boys? You reckon old Christopher will climb that ridge over? Absolutely. <laughs> Pretty steep. Have you seen it? It's a fucking sheer rock face, over. Yeah. Tank retriever, mate. It's a little hill. Oh, only one way to find out, over. Just shifting in the high. Just shifting in the high range. Well, we're climbing. Team Salvage is on the clock, searching for a crashed dirt bike in the Kalgoorlie goldfields. With dozens of abandoned mine shafts still to search, surveillance from high ground is their best option. But that means getting 22-tonne winch beast Christopher up onto a narrow, rocky ledge. Yeah, big Chris, -o. Christopher was built for this shit. Doubt at the little rock hopper. Chris -o, the winch beast, never lets us down. That's steep as piss. <laughs> oh, Chris -o just ate that up. We're going to go around and then go up the guts of that white stuff. Check yeah. out the flats through there. Yeah. With a 1,000 kilometre drive back to Salvage HQ ahead of them tomorrow, this search and rescue mission must be wrapped today. If we don't find it something soon, we're really going to have to call it. Yeah, we've just got to keep checking them. Let's just head down here, probably go back around the other side of this ridge. We'll go back down and we'll have a look down on that Check area that there. flats through there. It looks like there's a few, so... Head down to those white flats, what we spotted from that ridge line over. There's just two hours of daylight remaining. If they can't pull this off before sunset, Team Salvage's zero fail record will be blown apart. Failure is just not an option for me. It's something I can't come back from. If I lose this one, lose my reputation. Where is Ed now? Go over the back of that hillside. Over. Copy, we'll check over the back of this mound of shit. Looks like there's some motorbike tracks getting around here. If I was hooning, that's where I'd be hooning. I guess I am a hoon, so. That works too. You're a goon, not a hern. Right, our gang, I'm coming up on the other side of you. Yeah, we've got a big open hole over here. We'll have a look. Bullshit. Yeah. Poke the nose down there. Fuck off it is too. Yeah. How the fuck did he get down there? He fucking rode it. <laughs> the young fella obviously saw a jump, thought this is me. He obviously didn't realise there was a mine shaft on the other side of it. He's bloody lucky to be alive. Bike rider Mitch spent a week in hospital with a cracked head and a busted knee. He was lucky to get out of there alive. Fuck, I never thought we'd find that. His motorbike was not so lucky. It's jammed end to end at the bottom of the shaft. Getting it out before dark without damaging it will be dangerous. These abandoned mine shafts can be deceiving. They have false floors, they have horizontal shafts, they can collapse at any moment. Let's get the truck in position and then we'll get the setup out there, eh? Christopher is a $400,000 machine and he's irreplaceable. If he falls in the hole, who's going to salvage us? The dirt bike only weighs 120 kilos. Christopher can lift more than 800 times that. But positioning the 22-tonne tank retriever over an unstable mine shaft needs careful planning. Straddling a mine shaft that could collapse at any moment with a 22-tonne army truck isn't a light decision. Well, we need to overhang him enough 
so that we're dead centre over the hole. Otherwise, we're just going to drag the bike up the edge and just wreck it more than it's wrecked. The only way to get the right position is to back Christopher up and drop the rear axles over the mine shaft. Have a go on that log on the other side. Good. Thank you very much. Winching from Christopher is all about access and precise angles. If the team is to drop a cable directly onto the dirt bike, Luke will need to position the winch beast over the hole with its back wheels and axle hanging in mid-air. How's that? Straight back now. Straight. Yep. Fucking sick. Christopher is in position, but his dual 100-ton high tensile steel winch cables are of no use right now. This job requires a more delicate touch if they're to retrieve the dirt bike without damaging it further. Got a little auxiliary winch here. It's usually to deploy these, but it's good for about 900 kilos a ton, which is plenty enough for what we're doing. The auxiliary winch will lift the dirt bike no problems. They'll also use it to lower Luke down the shaft to connect the cable to the bike. This is a bosun's chair. We use it in the marine industry to go up mass and to do work at height. But we're going to use it to go down a mine shaft. It sounds simple, but every salvage job has its own unique dangers. Uh, look, you know, we've got probably got a snakes down the hole. I know that sounds crazy, but most mine shafts are full of snakes. We've got to try and get that bike out straight. So hence the positioning of the truck needed to be pretty well bang on. So at least if we can get it lifted straight up, we've got half a chance. Righto, Fred, I reckon spool some cable in. Down. Down. After three hours of searching, the moment of truth has arrived. So here we go, down in the belly of the beast. Down in the belly of the beast. Yeah, no, all good. Yeah, so what we're going to look out for now, just trudging around the edge so that we don't kick two big bundies in there and he ends up crowning one in the melon. All that loose shit could slide down any time, so. Let's go down, Dan, slowly. Fuck! They stop! Oh. Running sweet up there, Fred? Yeah. Just running gently over this edge, but it should be right. After a successful three-hour search, the rescue part of the mission can finally begin. Team leader Luke is winched down to retrieve the crashed dirt bike, which is jammed end to end at the bottom of the mine shaft. Going into these mine shafts is risky business. There's stuff falling on my head. Fuck! And even more danger when I get to the bottom. The floor could collapse and it could go down another 50 to 100 metres. Right, I stop! And with just 90 minutes until sunset, they're running out of time to complete the job on budget. So we're down the bottom of the mine shaft. Bite looks pretty good. Levers are working. I reckon we might get the fucking firing straight up. Fuck you! Yeah. <laughs> Fucking first kick! What do you reckon, boys? <laughs> I can't. <coughs> the mosquitoes, nearly choked myself to death. Turn and no time. Not the smartest move by the team leader, eh? Right, oh, he's that right. Coming down. Good job, good job. But playtime is over. It'll be dark soon. Time to get this job done and dusted. All right. So what we're going to have to do, we'll go out front first, hold tight onto the rear tyre. Yep. And then you will be able to lift this up from the front tyre. Yep. And then you can just pull it across. You and Fred might have to, I don't know how you're going to let the winch cable out at the same time. No, uh, Fred can do it, or he can let it out. I'll rip it. We'll work it out. Yeah. Yep. The bike weighs 120 kilos. Lifting it is a breeze for winch beast Christopher. The problem is getting the bike up the narrow shaft without damaging it. That requires a delicate touch and a two-point lift plan. We're going to uh, go around the front tyre on the motorbike with a little sling, winch it up, and then we're going to have to 
drive the truck off the hole and lay the motorbike on the edge, get that away, back up, get Luke out. Easy as that. No doubt there'll be a snag for sure. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to wrap the sling around here. I kind of want it to be as short as I can. I'm going to try and choke it and get as much load over this wheel as I can. All right, here we go. We're going to cook onto this, bash it straight into the sling, and I reckon that should be a good lift point. The front wheel lift point is secured, but it's not enough on its own to guarantee a safe extraction. This rope should give me a little bit of control on it as it starts to go up. Luke will remain below as the bike is winched up. I'll hook this on the rear tyre. He will try and prevent the bike from smashing against the sides of the shaft, controlling spin via a rope attached to the rear wheel. A little bit of control on this sucker. All right, boys, we'll go for lift. We'll just keep it nice and slow and see what it's going to do over. Yeah, ready? Good. Nice and slow. Coming up. Righto, oh, no, she's coming up. Righto, oh, no, she's lifting. Yeah, we're doing good, boys. Just keep going straight up. Straight up, straight up. It's critical the bike stays in the middle of the shaft. Righto, oh, no, keep her going. She's looking good. Positioning Christopher over the edge of the hole achieved the right angle for the lift. Happy? Happy is. But now, Luke's stuck at the bottom of the shaft with 120 kilos of dirt bike dangling over his head. Right, so now he's just going to work out how he's going to wrestle it off of there. We just come forward slowly and just lay it on the bank. This. Pretty much, there's not much else we can do. Whatever you're doing, do it, because I'm nervous. Try and get that back rope. Do you want this rope? I can throw it out. No, uh, you're right. It doesn't feel great having a dirt bike dangling over my head. It's hanging from a cable, and if it falls, I've got nowhere to hide, and it's going to crown me. Go and sweep it. The team needs a new plan. Hey, Dan. Hey. Let me roll it up like I did on the truck. Yeah. Oh, you can get over there and just throw it to you. We're hoping to get the bike higher than it is. So it's plan D. Fred's idea is to stretch a strong strap across the open shaft and use that to swing the bike over to the edge. Why don't I walk that over? Dan needs to move cautiously. The edge of the shaft could collapse at any time and bury Luke down below. Hang on, let's get this tail out. Wrestling 120 kilos in midair requires considerable muscle. Want me to winch it? Right out, yeah. You got it? Run up there. The winch cable needs more play to get the bike over the edge. It's up to Dan to muster the strength of two men. Fucking mud guard. <sighs> Yeah, boys! Good job. Dan's superhuman effort helps save the day. Uh, gonna need a Cairo appointment after this, I'd say. Righto. All that remains now is to get Luke out. Fuck yeah. Hope and seek. Oh. Righto. Ready? Yep. Up. Oh, no. Good job. Job done. On time and to budget. Mitch and his parents arrive to collect their prize. You reckon a bit different the way you remember it or what? Oh, yeah. It's a bit um, dirty now. I'm very rusted. Should we wrap up? You like you didn't go down the hole with him? Yeah. yeah. I want the sun. Yeah. It's a low-budget job, but the real sense of satisfaction 
is to be able to give the young bloke his motorbike back so he can go out and hoon some more. Hopefully not break his neck, maybe a few scratches and bruises won't hurt him. Just crashed it straight in the hole. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Well, I guess you'll be back out at soon. Yeah, hopefully. From one hern to another, all's well that ends well. After a gruelling 1,000 kilometre trip back from the goldfields, Luke and Dan arrive at Salvage HQ, looking forward to a night off. Hi, boys. Hi. Hi. How are we feeling? Tired. You glad to be home? It depends what comes out of your mouth next, I suppose. <laughs> so, we've got another job. Oh, I told you. What, tonight? Yeah. It's a 18-foot uh, alley boat that's gone down on its mooring in Eagle Bay. And the time pressure on this one is we've got some really average weather coming through. Yeah. I know. Oh. This is their target. An 18-foot, 90-horsepower recreational vessel valued at $30,000. $5,000 job. I know it's a low budget, but it's just what it is. Selvage drags us all over the country. One minute we're in the gold fields, the next minute we're down on the beach in Eagle Bay. A few hassles are, the sand's pretty soft. A lot of sharks down this way, and we haven't really even seen the job. And then there's the weather. A massive storm front is closing in. If they don't salvage the vessel today, it could be irreparably damaged. Team Salvage could be looking at an all-nighter. So we're really just going to go there with as much gear as we need and hopefully make it work. Righto, boys. What have we got on the Sarbo? It's only about an 18-foot aluminium boat, 150 metres offshore. 150? Yeah. Whereabouts? Eagle Bay boat ramp. And shark hole in the shark hole, yeah. Under the pump on a time-critical boat rescue, Luke and Dan are joined by Jay. They're heading 40 kilometres southwest to the shark-infested waters of Eagle Bay. How are you feeling about that, Sherman? Sharks? Yeah. Well, you're going to get bitten, you're going to get bitten. That's scary. With 132 reported attacks and 18 fatalities, the south coast of Western Australia is one of the deadliest shark zones in the world. Dusk is feeding time, increasing the risk of an attack. So, yeah, it's definitely a notorious shark hangout. Especially at the moment. Plus, it's dark. And there's a big storm coming. If we don't get there and get it done tonight, the boat will sink and the storm will come in and just destroy what's left of it. Our only chance of recovering it is to do it now. And there's an added motivation to wrap the job before the storm hits. The budget is just $5,000, so there is no margin for cost blowouts. So we've really only got a couple of hours to get in there. The sand is really soft down in Eagle Bay. God, you better pray that you don't get bogged. You go over about a metre. The team's first order of business is to make sure the land cruiser and boat trailer don't get bogged in the soft sand. Stop. Perfect. That means letting some air out of the tyres. Softer the tyre, the more traction we get. Oh, look, we're definitely pushing against the sun. Uh, we really want to at least get a line on before the sun goes down. Once we get that done, at least then we can just run the rest of the recovery from the land. We don't have to worry so much about sharks. No, my luck, I'll be swimming in the shark, shark infested shithole. Watch the kids. I don't know. A one-kilometre trek up the soft beach brings the team level with the boat. New Yui. Get our trailer off. Yeah, that's good there. Got a good entry with that washout on that beach too. Yeah, I don't know if that'll help us or hurt us. I reckon it'll help us. Next step is to attach a line to the boat so that it can be winched to shore. Oh, we're just going to get Dan to go out there with that Dyneema rope. Yeah. At least it's nice and calm. Time for Dan to double as shark bait. Dan's the chosen one. He, uh, he seems to be always the one that jumps in the water first. He's the sacrificial slice of meat. A lovely little swim in the ocean. Beautiful. So we've got about 150 metres of Dyneema. It's a good tow line. It's 
pretty easy to handle. Float. Then it floats. Before diving into the shark-infested waters, Dan does a quick aerial surveillance looking for hazards. How far off are we? 93 metres. Probably about 110, 120 by the time we get in the car. But it looks like we're just kissing the bottom there. Yeah, just want to be able to get it to pull straight up and winch it straight up. So you just, I don't know, you're just going to have to climb up the front of it. Yeah, even I'll if you have to go up the other side and go up on the railing. Get up the railing. Yeah. Let's get in before it gets too dark. All right, done deal. Oh, well, let's go swimming, eh? Look, Dan's half fish. He's got more seats on than in herring. Plus, he hasn't had a shower in a few days, so it'll probably work out well. Oh, look, hopefully it shouldn't be too hard. Once we get the line out onto it, we'll be able to spin the cruiser around, get the winch to work, and then just slowly ease it in. The hard bit will be obviously trying to load it on the trailer because it'll be heavy, and then getting the trailer and the boat off this soft beach. I just have to watch for any knots or any tangles in the rope, otherwise Dan will chuck a little hissy fit. It's getting really dark really quickly and a little bit scared for Dan being out in the water. Jokes aside, because I do call him chum, it's, um, it is a little bit scary because I do know that there is sharks around. So hopefully he can get in and get out real quick. Swim out there and whack this here rope on it. And uh, when we pull it over, it, hopefully it won't just sit on the bottom. It just looks like there's still a little bit of air in it. I dare say the outboard's just holding it on the bottom. We should be uh, swimming in in the dark, I'd say. Well, just on dusk. Just gonna climb up top there. Put this on, get a bit of mooring lines and play winter. How's he looking? Yeah, he's out there. Oh, he's aquamanning. He's climbing it, yeah. Aquamanning. <laughs> Like a little slippery seal. Like a little slippery <laughs> snake. Oh, he's on top. Yeah, he is. He's so handy sometimes, little he's Aquaman. Very handy. Now that the rope is secure, Dan does a quick scout around the cabin to assess the extent of the damage. All the electronics are gone, windscreen smashed off it. There's a big tangle of life jackets. Engine's obviously submerged. You know, there's, there's probably 20 grand's worth of damage here. So the plan is to try and get the boat out of the water before dark. I can handle working in the dark on the beach, but screwing around in the water in the dark is not ideal. What we're going to do is we're going to attach the Dyneema line to the front of the cruiser and then we'll just back it up and we'll just keep backing it up over and over, reset the line until we're in. Then once we get in close, we use the winch to give us the muscle to get it up. The beach is only 30 metres wide and the boat is 150 metres offshore. The team will need to keep going backwards and forwards, constantly resetting the tow line to get the boat to shore. It's a little winch. Yeah. Hey, Dan, how many resets do you reckon? Four. Oh, yeah. What do you got? Five. What do you reckon, Jade? Hey. How many resets? Six. The Land Cruiser's V8 engine makes short work of pulling the boat over and dragging it in. I mean, we're doing okay. We've got about 10 minutes left of sunlight. And, um, yeah, then I'll get a little dark. Problem is, they can't load the boat onto the trailer while it's upside down. Well, if it doesn't turn the right way around, we're going to have to flip it. The big hassle is going to try to get this thing to straighten up as we come up. If it doesn't straighten itself, we're going to have to get in there and make it go straight. And that's not going to be that easy. Oh, it was just about to come up. I actually thought it was going to flip over and then that would have been sweet as, but if it doesn't turn over, it looks like Luke's going to get wet too and I don't think he's too happy about that. The boys will have to get in the water, I'll probably have to get in too. And we'll probably have to try and flip it with some manpower. Yeah, if we can beat this storm, beat the sun, 
and get it to ride over. I don't believe it's going to go our way. We good, Dan? Come on, sweetheart. Team Salvage is battling fading light and there's a massive storm front closing in. They need to remove the $30,000 recreational boat from the water and fast. So important to get a turnover. It'll make our job so much easier and we'll be able to get out of here before it gets too dark. So this one, this one, it's going to turn over. They'll need a few more tow resets to get the boat to shore. But if it remains upside down, it will be impossible to get it up onto a trailer. Here we go, here we go. Starting to straighten up. Starting to straighten up. There we go, here we go, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> it. Happy days. Winch traction has done the trick. The boat is right side up for now but it could flip back over at any time. We'll go one more pull. We're going to have to winch from there. The toes sorted. Job done. Now for phase two, winching the boat up and onto the trailer. The reason it's starting to dig in is because that outboard's starting to jam into the sand. But there's a problem with the boat's position. The outboard's digging into the sand, so we're going to have to undo the valve at the bottom and undo the, the trim release so it can tilt up. And then um, we've got more luck of letting it slide up the sand under the trailer. They're just about out of light, and that storm is fast approaching. They need to lift the outboard motor urgently, or all their hard work will be for nothing. So once we get that up, We'll be able to move forward and get it out of here. Shark bait Dan has to get back in the water. It's a bit sharky down the southwest here. You know, you can't really have that on your mind all the time. You know, you're going to get bit, you're going to get bit. I'm trying to see in this hole. We really need to get that release sorted. Otherwise, we're... How you going, Dan? It's this hole down here, isn't it? Didn't feel down here. Well, no, it's not that one. It's not that one, for sure. Is there something up top here? No. No, it's, it's that. It's that one screw. If we don't get that one screw, job's on. I can handle working in the dark on the beach, but screwing around in the water is not ideal. The problem is there's a trim, a hydraulic trim release valve in the side of the transom assembly. And if you can't undo it, then you can't manually lift the outboard up. It all comes down to Dan locating this one tiny release valve to allow them to lift the motor. They're going to fucking stuck here all night. That's what's going to happen. One fucking poxy screw. Okay. I think I found it. Flatty? Yeah. It's a different hole. Undo it all the way. Yeah, you got it. I thought it gave from it. Yeah, you're a fucking legend. Give it a winch. It's pretty buried. Yeah. Now it's back to winching the boat up onto the beach in preparation for loading it onto the trailer. Hello. Right, Good. Yeah. The V8 Land Cruiser is no Christopher, but its front winch is doing the trick. Alright, so we've got the boat up as far as we can. Now we just have to wait until we get enough water out of it so it's light enough to crawl it up and then we can start looking to get on the trailer. The boat will definitely need a full refit. The hull's probably the only structurally sound part left on it, but I guess that's really the part we're retrieving. What we're going to do is hook the trailer up now and we'll reverse it under so that at least the boat can just skid up the back of the trailer without too much pressure. Meanwhile, the water will continually drain out and it will get lighter. From the gold fields to the ocean, it's been a long 48 hours for Luke and Dan, and it's far from over. Ooh, it's going to be a long night. 
We've just driven a thousand k's. Job's not going that well. Really, just want to wind it up, go home, and hug my pillow. We'll try it with a little boat winch, but such is pretty light. Drop it in that hole. To save time, Luke opts to use the small boat winch on the trailer rather than turning the Land Cruiser around and using its larger front winch. I think we're dreaming, gang, but we'll give it a go. The boat only weighs 800 kilos, but there's more than two tonnes of water still trickling from the vessel. Oh. Oh. Get ya? Yeah. So we've tried to cheat and uh, use the boat winch and the little hook to try and drag it on the trailer. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Use my fucking cat-like reflexes to just... Did it actually get you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a shitbox. That boat winch is probably only rated at about 800 kilos, but it'll probably deal with double that. Sadly, the hook gives way. It scraps me in the neck. The winch hook narrowly misses Luke's face. It was a close call for the team leader. Are you right? Yeah. Where did it get wow. you? Skim past my ear. <laughs> He's yeah. not funny, but... He is funny. <laughs> well, you need to wear a helmet to work. I'm laughing on the outside, but I'm really worried in the inside. <laughs> He's a very lucky man. Well, that's what you get for standing in your own winch line. Cat-like reflexes. Saves you every time. Oh, well, shit happens. Yeah, now that uh, Luke's taken himself out with the, the trailer winch, we're going to turn the cruiser around and use the front one. Hopefully, this works a little bit better. All right, let's get the real winch. We're going to run the sheave block again so it doubles the power of the winch and halves its speed. We don't have a plan B. We're just going to stick to plan A. Try not to take any shortcuts this time. Prepare for the worst, hope for the best. Yeah, that's all right. Time to winch. At stake, beating the storm and getting paid. No, we're definitely not home yet. Biggest issue we've got now is to try and get this thing out of the sand hole we've created. It's pretty heavy now, and then we've just got to try and yank it out of here in one go and try and spin it up, head to starboard and get out up the boat ramp. Once we get a bit of momentum under our belt, we should be fine. Yeah. Whether they make budget or not will depend on what happens next. Everyone's good? Yeah. Here goes nothing. Fingers crossed. Pretty soft. It's looking pretty promising for a minute there. Yeah. We'll give it another crack. The best thing I like about the Land Cruiser is it's a V8. What it lacks in ability, it makes up for in momentum. Right in the tape. It's a knife. <laughs> well, guys, we're good. We're home. Bloody long night. We made it, but as always, the Toyota performed amazingly, and the gang's done really well. So, time to go home and catch some Z's. Airing up the tyres. What? Shooting? Oh, hecky. Uh, ah! Ah! <laughs> Ooh, nasty. Oh, uh, good eye, boy. Good job, boy. We did good. <laughs>
threatens to drag Team Salvage, facing ten to hundred thousand dollar fines, into a world of fines and penalties. Who's gonna crush it, eh? Fucking Salvage. Jobs in Quinn and up, yeah? Yeah. And it's a tractor. There's a tractor stuck in a swamp. The owners have got to try and cut some fire breaks through, otherwise they're going to face some pretty big fines. So the fire breaks have to be done by the end of the week. So we really only allow us for today to get it out. Team Salvage is heading three hours south of HQ to the Quinn and up National Park to remove this an eight tonne, 1976 six cylinder diesel harvester. It's bogged in swampy ground in the middle of a fire break zone and full of nasty chemicals, oil and petrol. All toxic and all explosive. God, is it really stuck? Yeah, <laughs> it's been stuck for ages. Australia's recent bushfire season claimed 3,000 homes. More than 13 million hectares of land went up in flames. What we've got to do, gang, we're going to go down and remove an old tractor out of some fire breaks at the Eco Tourist Park. With the oncoming bushfire season, it's now an emergency. Mm -hmm. If we don't get the tractor out of the way, the fire breaks can't be put in and they'll incur massive fines, let alone the cost to contractors to come in and do it for them. Yeah, right. So it really is putting the whole park and all the campers at risk. This is what a firebreak looks like. A gap in the vegetation that acts as a barrier to slow or stop the progress of a bushfire. Four-wheel drive trails and highways do the same job. Team Salvage is travelling in convoy. Luke, Dan, Jade and Ellie are in the Land Cruiser. Following heavy load truck driver Ryan, who is carting Christopher the team's $400,000 military-grade tank retriever. So I've just got a text from Jacinta. She just got off the phone from the owner of the Eco Tourist Park. He's very stressed about getting that tractor off the emergency fire break system today. They don't have a lot of money, so we've only quoted them five grand to get the job done. But it really means that we've got five hours before it gets dark to complete the whole job. This is the Eco Park. It caters for 300 campers during summer, and every one of them will be at risk if the toxic tractor isn't removed to make way for the fire break. The team has five hours to complete the job to budget. So, Ellie, you're going to run the truck in there backwards. There's a few issues. There's some fence posts and that in there that we're going to have to look out for. Run them over. You can do that, but if you tangle up your boyfriend, you're not going to go on a date, are you? Luke, Ryan and Dan prep Christopher for action. Luke's decided to let Ellie and Jade run the job today. Just suits Dan and I fine. We can just sit back and see how it unfolds. Ooh, 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 ooh. All right, foot hard on the brake. All right, winches both of them. Christopher is Team Salvage's secret weapon, an Oshkosh tank retriever purchased from the United States Air Force. We got him. The winch beast is equipped with two 25mm steel cables capable of pulling 50 tonnes each. Yeah, the game! So, start him up. Probably you can get on Ellie's side. Yep. I'll get on Jade's side. And then, Ryan, if you just sort of stand back and walk back with him, and we just guide him down nice and slow. It's pretty difficult. I mean, backing Christopher down, I don't really know how big he is. I can't see all angles. Very different to reversing my own car. Christopher needs to be parked in a straight line, facing the tractor, to ensure the winch cables don't buckle during the tow. Swing the back wheels around this tree here and back into here, so we need a pretty well straight line. Other way, up. 
There's a lot of things the girls need to take into account with positioning of the truck. Straight back. The main one is to keep the winch cables direct onto the job. So, Dan, just watch that big log there, Dano. Winches have got 40 tonne of pull and it jams the cable so badly in the basket that the second it gets on the piss, the cable spools wrong on the barrel and it starts to jam it. The job's finished. Watch that big log there. Ellie's got to back Christopher down into a really tight spot. We just have to be careful for any fence wiring, yeah, anything that could, you know, burst or punish one of the tyres. Good, that angle's sweet. Fucking good job. See much? Fucking good job. Ellie's <laughs> <laughs> done a great job. Missed all the obstacles. We didn't tangle in any wire. How are we going? Yeah, you did great. That was awesome. That was awesome. Bloody awesome. Christopher's in position. The next challenge is attaching the winch cables to the tractor. Attachment points on the tractor. We have to go around something strong, around the chassis, axles, somewhere where we, you know, that's, it's not going to just start ripping the tractor to bits. Plan is, you'll deploy that auxiliary winch. We'll run it all the way down to the tractor through a pulley and then come all the way back up and we'll pick up the port winch first. We'll release the clutch on it and then we'll control it with the auxiliary. The tractor only weighs eight tonnes, but it's seriously bogged in the mud. Christopher's dual high tensile steel cables can pull up to 100 tonnes. So, this, the middle one is the auxiliary. The middle one. Up is deploy, down is in. But getting Christopher's cables to the tractor needs work. Remember the speed dog? This one? Yeah. Yeah, hold it. Go around that axle. We're just looking at the tractor, trying to find a good tow point. Yeah, bringing both both things out, that's it. We obviously need something that's going to be quite secure and a main sourcing machine. We need to find somewhere that's going to help us steer the tractor as well. So then I'll give you this shackle, yeah. and then you'll be able to go on that. The auxiliary winch is secure. Now to attach Christopher's 25mm steel cables to the harvester's chassis. It's a bit squeaky. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I've been um, working on my muscles at boot camp, so I reckon I could do it myself these days. But um, we'll see if I can get that on one of the big jobs, just in case I need some man strength. It's a lot easier, eh? Yeah. The setup's pretty easy. We've got the short cables out and then dragged the big ones out. So far, I think we're doing pretty well. What do you reckon, Ryan? You like it not getting your hands dirty today, buddy? I am. I like standing here. Right through there. So, just go through that like there. Straight back onto itself. Yeah. The tractor's stuck right in the middle of the fire brake zone. The brake itself will loop right around the caravan park. If the team doesn't get the tractor out today, the caravan park owner will incur a $10,000 on-the-spot environmental fine. So far, we're doing well. Girls are performing as usual. At least we've got the cables out. With the steel cables now connected to the tractor, it's time for Christopher to earn his keep and haul the eight-ton tractor out of the bog. So when we start winching, they're going to rev the engine right up and it's going to generate a lot of heat and a lot of power. That's when we need to keep an eye on it. That's, that's the critical critical stage, make sure the engine doesn't seize up while we're winching. How's the temperature looking in there? Wait, 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 stop. Dan went to stop. But in the salvage game, things are never simple. All right, let's go and have a look at this. Fuck. We've got a coil leak. Fuck, that's the last thing we need. Christopher's hydraulic engine cooling system has sprung a leak. 
So the coolant is what keeps the engine cool. Without coolant, it overheats, the job stops. It's either a blown head gasket, but I'm hoping it's a stuck thermostat. If it's a blown head gasket, it's complete engine stripped down, we're talking 20 grand plus. So if we lose too much coolant, the engine could just seize up completely and that'd be the end of the job and Christopher would be stuck in the swamp as well. All right, let's go and have a look at this engine temp. Yeah, she's climbing. Temperature's climbing, we're up to about 83 now, so look, if it goes up another 15, 20 degrees, we've got a serious issue. Up and out some fluid. Coolant's still leaking out. We just have to watch it and make sure it doesn't get hot. Otherwise, the job's all over. Fuck it. Team Salvage is on an urgent mission to remove this bogged harvester from a fire break zone so the bush can be cleared in preparation for the upcoming fire season. The break will protect the eco caravan park from bushfires. Trouble is, winch beast Christopher is leaking engine coolant, putting the whole operation in jeopardy. This is only a $5,000 job. The last thing I need to do is jeopardise a half a million dollar truck. We definitely have a coolant leak going. I'm not very enthusiastic about that. Yeah. I just got a text from Jacinta. She said, urgent job for tomorrow morning. Yacht salvage in protected marine park. Has to be done tomorrow. Be there at 8.30 a.m. No screw-ups. All right, hun. Bye. At Salvage HQ, Ops Manager Jacinta is gathering details about the team's next job. So we've had a call about a 35-foot, two-and-a-half-ton boat that's washed up on a beach in Safety Bay. This is the vessel, a $70,000 yacht that's run aground over a bed of protected seagrass. Because it's heavily protected, we're up for some massive fines if anything goes wrong, either with beach access or with disturbing the seagrass. And with Christopher leaking engine coolant and the tractor stuck in a fire break, the odds are stacking up against Team Salvage. Just got to hope Christopher holds out. We have to wind this up this afternoon. Let's just roll it up and get it done. All right, this one. Luke's blocked the leak for now. His plan is to forge ahead and hope Christopher's engine doesn't overheat and seize up. When these winches come on, the engine's going to go into some real load, and that's really going to be our proving point. It could be our Achilles heel. Winch control we want to high. Yep. What's the go? You good? All right, up. Winch bitches. What I reckon we'll do is both, both at the same time. Let's go. All right, ready? There she comes. Go, you beast. Yes. Gritsip is good for 100 tonne. The tractor only weighs eight, but with suction, it can easily be double that. We're going to run two winch cables on it, most of all so we can get steering. We want this job to be smart and fast. The winch beast is hanging in there. The engine's hot, but stable. It's the 44-year-old tractor that isn't playing ball. The old tractor's got no steerage at all. One way or another, we need to work out a way of steering it. After months in the swamp, the tractor's hydrostatic power steering system has jammed. If we can't get these wheels straight, that tractor's just going to go into the bush and start wiping out trees. The owners might cop another big fine if we do that. Right, Jade, well, what we'll get you to do is just hang off on yours for a bit. We're going to try and make the tractor come around. Luke checks in on Christopher's coolant leak. Temperature's holding all right. We stopped dripping coolant. Yeah, Christopher. His quick fix has worked. The head gasket wasn't the problem so there won't be a $20,000 repair bill. All right, stop there. I'll just bring yours up, Jade. Let's just pull it. We might just keep pulling anyway. You have to be mindful when running both the winches. You have to make sure the tension is balanced out on both ends, and you have to make sure that the cable doesn't overspool. All right, Jade, this one. If it overspores, it can potentially snap the winch cables. That could be quite dangerous. 
We'll keep pulling with this winch so that it comes one way. We're going to keep pulling anyway. It's an educated risk and I'm the only one taking it. All right, stop there. We're going to have to get that steering sorted. So the steering has been sitting for a while. It's locked sideways. It's just a shit box. So we're stopped. Christopher could deliver more pulling power, but with a dodgy engine coolant system, it's not worth the risk. We might take this hydraulic lines off and see if we can release the pressure a little bit, maybe something else. We've had to cut the line because we may be fighting the hydraulic pressure of the power steering assist ram. Upgrade. Now that the hydraulic system is no longer controlling the wheels, a manual steering option can be employed in the form of a come-along. The come-along is a hand-operated chain winch. So we intend to use the come-alongs to force the tractor steering wheels to do what we want them to. What we'll do is we'll load up this starboard winch pretty hard. Try and pull it around. Try and get it around, because the port one's starting to grab the lugs on the tyre. Yeah. And I'll just keep tweaking and this. leave this one slack. Jade and Ellie will winch Christopher in stages. So I reckon if we can get two of those come along set up, Ryan runs one, you run the other. I'll just run the truck with the girls, you guys run the steering, and we'll fucking just move out of here. All right, so we can go? Yeah. Good to go. All right, both his. All right, slow yours down a bit. You keep going. All right, stop there. Now we're going to have to straighten up. It's gone too far one way. Now we're going to have to just crank it back the other. All right, gang. We're going to have to get a move on. Looks like the rain's coming. It's going to get muddy and wet. Timing is critical on this one. There's not much budget. There's not much time. We've got another job booked in first thing in the morning. So I don't want to be working in the dark, and I don't want to be working in the rain. It's now or never. All right, let's do this. So I think what we'll do is we'll, when it gets to about here, I guess you're just aiming to go around that tree there. Yep. So as it starts to come, you can pretty well start to go this way as it comes up to here, and then we'll just pull it up straight to the back of the truck. So we'll winch to there. Yep. All right, let's do this. Winning up National Park and storm clouds are rolling in. Right, oh girls. That's not good news for Team Salvage, who is struggling to remove an eight ton tractor from a fire break zone. The tractor's steering is jammed, making winching in a straight line difficult. So we've got a makeshift steering wheel in the form of two big come alongs to stop the tractor veering off into the bush. Ryan and Dan will attempt to turn the wheels manually with hand winches. Ellie and Jade will operate winch beast Christopher's dual 25mm high tensile steel cables. What I'll do too, Dan, is I'll slow the winch speed down so it gives you time to run, because yep. I feel like that's a bit fast. Yeah. Because it's hard to run the girls two winches at once. Yeah. Like, between Facebook posts and shit, I need them to be looking what they're doing. We'll go down the slow speed on the winches, and that'll give you guys time. Yep. Time is the enemy here. If the tractor isn't out of the fire break zone by close of business today, the client will be fined $10,000. And then there's the boat salvage job that starts first thing tomorrow. Do we need to turn it a bit more? Up on yours? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I reckon too. It's back-breaking work for Dan and Ryan, and critical that the team keeps the winching angle straight or it could all go pear-shaped. All right, just hang down for a sec. We're going to slow the winch speed stop. It's very important we keep the winch cable straight with the load. If they don't, they cross over and they will jam, and it will cost us time. All right, this one, Ellie. Wait, hold up. Let mine go tighter. Yeah, just try and get yeah, the cables. Down. Keep them same tension. Slow yours a little bit, babe, yeah. Good job, girls, good job. Yep, so then we just roll it down like that and go. 
These cables are good for about 80 tonne a side. That strap's well and truly loaded. I've snapped a lot of stuff and I've seen what happens. So I'm honestly, I'm not really worried about it. Looking good to me. But yeah, doing good. Wink duty, I absolutely love it. One of my favourite parts. <laughs> All right, hold them both. I reckon we're good there. The tractor is out of the bog, but not yet out of the woods. The team needs to speed things up. Bring the tractor right to the back of the truck, and then I think we might just try and drive it up and around out of here. What do you reckon, Ron? What happened to the girls doing all the work on this job? <laughs> hey, they are doing all the work. <laughs> <laughs> hey? Look at my hands. Fuck it, Ron. He's got his hands dirty. Of course, we're doing all of the work, but you know, something like this happens <laughs> and we need to call in the boys for a little bit of help, but uh, yeah, so typical. Christopher's capable of skull dragging up to 20 tonnes of dead weight. Luke positions the tank for the tow. It's over to Jade That's to guide the tractor out of the bush and into the caravan park. As per the salvage contract, the owner will take over from there. Straighten up a bit, baby. Go. More. Yep. Head on. <laughs> All right, now switch, straighten up a bit so we can come around the corner. Oh. Yeah, that's perfect. You want to straighten up a bit now? Yeah, I reckon. Perfect. All right, swing it right, swing it right. Yeah. Just straight like that. Just hold up. Stop there. Stop. Oh. All right, stop. Stop, Jade. All right. You're going to have to go hard Foot on your break. way, otherwise we're going to hit this big tree. All right, slip it to the end. That'll probably do. We'll just go back a bit more and then straighten again. her up. Go again? Yep. And just crawl. Little bit of throttle. Break it hard. We're gonna make it out. Yep. Keep cranking. Oh, a bit more speed, babe. Yeah, maintain that speed. It's perfect. I reckon just swing right, and then just before we get to this tree, start yeah. to turn right so you go around it. Have to walk it with just a little bit more, and we'll stop. All right, just stop there. Yeah, it seemed like a pretty simple job at the beginning, just a simple tow, but um, as every job in salvage, there's always something. But uh, lucky we had the boys with us, so they could uh, do a few assists along the way. Yeah, a little set up and uh, help us finally get him out. Put it in neutral and hopefully it'll just roll back a little bit to take the slack off there. A few little technical issues we overcome, but the gang worked really well together and the girls did really good. Very proud and have done an amazing job. Let's go. Righto, let's call it a day. There you go. Job done on time and to budget. Awesome. We're done. Let's get out of here. There'll be no $10,000 fine for the park owner. Good run. She's always been a good tractor. I know it doesn't look like it, but it's always a good tractor. <laughs> but tomorrow, it'll be Team Salvage on the line. If they damage the protected seagrass while trying to refloat the yacht, they'll be up for multiple environmental fines in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Days like this, I hate my job. Go for Luke. I've just got off the phone to Parks and Wildlife and we've been granted permission to get into that marine park. OK, safety bay. Oh, yeah, that yacht that washed up. Yes, try and refloat it. But, and this is a big but, you need to be super careful because there are grasses there that are heavily protected. So there needs yep. to be no damage when you're pulling the boat out to the grasses or to the beach or we will be up for some massive fines. 
Team Salvage is heading straight from Job 1 in Quinnanup to Job 2 in Safety Bay. They're on an urgent mission to refloat a beached yacht in an environmentally protected marine park. All right, you've got four hours. No worries, I'll give you a call when we're done. Thank you, be careful. Roger. All right, ciao for now. Bye. Oh. The yacht is a 35-foot, two-and-a-half-ton aluminium hull racing craft worth $70,000. Its name is Unhinged, and it's a repeat offender. This is the third time the vessel has breached its moorings, but now it's threatening a bed of protected seagrass. The seagrass is the dark, shadowy area under the water, and they'll need to drag the boat across it to refloat it. It may seem a little odd that we're protecting seagrass. People may say it's just seaweed, but it's a food source for the basic marine life which feed the oceans. As part of the deal, the yacht's owner has agreed to provide a tow boat. A lot of the seagrass fields are very unique to WA, so like a lot of the species that are here are only, only in WA, nowhere else. Ah, oh, so it's all protected. So it's, it's all, all protected areas. Shit that washes up at the beach and we don't know what. Yeah. Oh, we won't hurt that, will we? Well, that yacht's got a pretty big keel, so we just need to be mindful on where we drag it. So because it's a refloat, they're going to have to drag it back out over the seagrass, and I just need them to be super careful not to disturb any of it. Oh. Mast on the beach. What? Stay away. <laughs> yeah, we're up against a few issues, like the boat's pretty big, so the plan will be to tow it off the shore and get it out into deeper water so it can at least float and get the keel free of the sand. Yeah, we've got a few time pressures. Uh, tide's on its way out. It's not ideal. We've sort of missed the high tide by a couple of hours. But we want to try and get it while there's still as much water as we can to float it. The lower the tide, the higher the chances of damaging the seagrass. So we want that 30-ton sling, big softy, and we want probably two spools of the white line. If we went in there and just ripped it all up, you know, you'd be facing ten dollars to $100,000 fine. But uh, I'm hoping to get out of here with zero damage. You know, we've, we've managed to keep our record pretty clean so far, so I reckon we'll win on this one too. Hey, Ron. How are you? Story goes it's been on the beach more than once. I think the owner's probably a little bit more unhinged than the yacht. Good to meet you, buddy. Yeah, you too. I'll give you a radio so we can talk to you. Uh-huh. So what we'll do is we'll just hook up the bridle We'll do that now, and then we'll get a tow line out to you. Yeah. The keel's still got its lead weight on the bottom. Yeah, is it bulbous? I think, yeah. Yeah, okay. So we'll get this hooked up, and we'll give it a tug and see what's going to happen. Uh -huh. That's the plan. We had it secured on what we thought was a pretty reasonable mooring, and it's broken the fail-safe anchor chain. I thought we were safe, but we weren't. Is that attached to it, babe? Yeah, come and grab it and drag it up. Up the beach. Yeah, see if you can drag it up the beach. With the tide going out fast, the team needs to get a move on. Go on, girls. You know what? Just need me, don't you? <laughs> drag it. The plan to refloat this yacht is to drag it out on its side. Yachts take a lot of water to float, so the only way we can keep the keel clear is to drag it sideways out until it gets enough water for the keel to go down and start to float on its own. What I reckon, Dan, is let's get that, that big strap and we'll go round the base of this keel here and then up to that bollard and it should form a bit of a V. So I guess if we can get that, maybe the 50 tonner and the other one connected and go round, we sort of want it to finish somewhere here and then we'll use maybe one of the other straps to just hook around that bollard that will give us the angle we need can't go off the front bollard just by itself, we'll end up ripping it off. So we go around the keel, strap it up to the front. Two best days in a man's life. The day he buys a boat and the day he sells it. All right, pull them. Make sure there's no twists in it. Yeah. And they're even. It's critical to free the keel from the sand before attempting to tow the yacht out to sea. What we need to do is try and counterweight the boat a bit because we've got so much mechanical advantage. We only need probably about 100 kilos of downforce on the end of the mast to try and rock the boat up because the keel's really badly wedged in the sand. I'll get this one of these halyards set up. 
All right, girls. Who's got the strongest stomach? Ellie. Oh, Ellie. Ellie's got the strongest stomach. Jade and Ellie will remove any loose floats that could add drag to the toe. Yeah, that's the one we need. We need slack on it. It stinks up there. You want me to undo this? Yeah, undo that. That'll drop that float off the other side. Probably there, lock it off there. And then wrap it back around that winch. Heaps of times. It stinks up here. Got all bird shit all on my hands. That'll go around there. Yeah, perfect. But there's a problem with the tow boat that owner Ron has brought with him. Girls, what? can you go up and grab the other end of that line? You've got to go all in. Why? You've got to go to the no, boat. No, not. To the boat. To the boat. It's way too small and underpowered. Old Mr Unhinged has his own little recreational boat. It's definitely not ideal for towing. Hang on, guys, hang on. FDA, it's our purpose-built salvage boat. Definitely working me hard. FD8 is the team's go-to salvage vessel. But it's 180 kilometres away at HQ in Bustleton. Boat owner Ron agreed to provide the tow boat as part of the rescue deal. This is going to be our biggest drag point. So we've got a serious horsepower mismatch here. Ron's little tow boat's only got 225 horsepower. We're going to need at least three times that to be effective. You know, we've got two and a half tonne of yacht to drag out of the sand. So that's why I don't know if this little boat's going to have the power. But at this point, we've got nothing else. We've just got to use what we got. Once you get that sorted out, we'll just put a bit of load on it and see what happens. Yep. Ronnie's rocked up with his little, little sport fishing boat. I'll take one look at it and it's not really ideal for the situation. Much pressure on it, is it? Barely even loading up the strap. They need Ron's boat to punch a lot harder. He'll jam in the sand. And it'll pull us over, we can keep going. Well, we definitely need a way bigger boat. The problem is it's just too shallow. Big boats draw a lot of water and we don't have a lot of water. Ron, just put some pressure on it, just keep it on there just to see if we can get this keel to start washing away underneath. Low tide is an hour away. Every delay increases the risk of the tow damaging the seagrass. And with that comes the risk of a huge environmental fire. It doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere. No. It's not moving. Well, we're dreaming trying to get this thing off the beach with such a small boat. We probably need another 500 horsepower. We're just going to have to come up with a more different idea. Safety Bay, Western Australia. Too shallow, so we're definitely going to have to come up with an inventive idea to make this thing move. And Team Salvage has come up short in its battle to refloat unhinged. A $70,000 racing yacht beached in a marine reserve covered with protected seagrass. Yes, yeah, so we don't have enough power to pull. It doesn't look like it's going anywhere at all. And Luke reckons the kill's buried in the sand a little bit. At stake, hundreds of thousands of dollars in environmental fines. Ron's towing vessel doesn't have enough grunt to shift the two and a half ton yacht. We're pretty limited to what size boat we can use because the bay's so shallow. A bigger boat means more water. 
we don't have more water. Luke and Dan hatch up a new plan. Grab one of the shovels and start digging this out. Fucking sick. Sick one. This is pointless. I know. Yeah, good one, Luke. Unhinged. How ironic. Uh, what about changing your setup here? Setup's good. Setup's it's not going to change anything. Push it. We can get the truck and push it. Dan comes up with the idea that we should use Christopher to give it a nudge. What we're going to do, Ron, we're going to go get my big Selby's truck. So if you can just keep that line with a bit of tension on it for a bit, we'll go and organise the truck. Over. Yeah, over. That little boat out there doesn't have enough horsepower, so we need to get some more muscle. I know just the guy for the job. Winch Beast Christopher is parked in a nearby reserve. Luke and Dan head off to collect it. Owner Ron reflects on unhinged wrap sheet. A couple of times the anchor rope got caught around the keel and uh, chafed and, and off it went. The other time it dragged a big anchor. But yeah, this has been the biggest disaster. Weighing in at 22 tonnes with an 800 horsepower engine under the hood. Hello, Christopher. <laughs> Good boy. Team Salvage's military grade tank retriever has more than enough power to push unhinged off the beach. All right, we'll go for start. Things just go from bad to worse. As usual, there's always complications. Christopher has a flat battery. We just got to charge the batteries. The batteries have shit themselves. But that's easier said than done. Christopher runs a pretty complicated battery bank. He has four six volt batteries in series, in parallel. One of the batteries has dropped the cell at some stage, and there's no way around that. We're charging now. These batteries aren't available in Australia. They come direct from the US Army, and it takes what it takes. The worst part about that is it's really eaten into our work window. Low tide is in 30 minutes, but by then, the water level may be too low to attempt a refloat. Hey, Ron. Luke needs a contingency plan. Might be worth thinking about if we, who's got a bigger boat that we could use. Because it would be good to have a backup, backup plan. Yeah, over. The longer we wait here, the further the tide will go out and the harder our job's going to be. I think one of the, one of the cells has dropped completely. We'll give it another five. I can salvage. Days like this, I hate my job. I just hate looking like a cock. Mate, that is impossible. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the vote of confidence. <laughs> you called it. Oh, you got you, I you called it. I oh, just backed it straight in there. They can't afford to charge the batteries any longer. Everything depends on Christopher starting now. Yeah, the boys. We've only just started. Yeah. <laughs> Running. Bloody bastard. We're gonna ram the back of the yacht in the front of the truck. Yeah, the Christopher. Did his job just like I knew he would. He likes fucking with me sometimes. Not ideal. It's not gonna be a matter of horsepower on this one, it's gonna be about traction. The plan is to get Christopher and basically just punch this thing clean off the shore into the water. Once we've got some water under the hull, Ron's little boat should be able to deal with it. I'm staggered. I'm stunned. What a ripper. Holy cow. We should be able to nudge up right there, Dan. Yeah, pretty strong there. So what we're going to do, we're just going to air these tyres down. Then we've got some tyres, we'll nudge up on the transom. And then I'll get you to put some pressure on, but it's going to take about five, ten minutes before we get set up. Over. OK, I've got all that. Roger that. Over. Cool, lads. Right. Sounds easy. So, Christopher, he's got a big flat plate on the front, like a ball bar type thing. We'll just push it first. It might just fucking slide around. We'll pivot on that a bit. Hopefully push in the water without smashing the back in. Light us up close. Unhinged is a $70,000 lightweight aluminium hull racing yacht. 
Christopher is a half a million dollars worth of military grade steel. Once the yacht's actually floating, it will be an easy tow. The hard part is getting it into deep water. Christopher being 22 tonne, you know, there's not a lot he can't push through. But the problem is we don't want to push through the structure of the boat. Otherwise, there's no point salvaging it if it's just going to sink anyway from damage that Christopher has created. I'll back it up, squeeze that in there. Good? It's going to crush it, eh? So? I split it when it's going to sink. Why split it? There's just going to be a load on it. See what it does. Ah, oh, Luke. He's like a little big kid. He's just straight into it. We're committed. What are you, you going to do? Fuck the yacht. Why fuck the yacht? You'll just oh. dent it a bit. Let's just give it a little nudge and see what happens. Let's be honest. He's a full throw head. <laughs> yep, a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. Whoa, 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 stop. Stop, go back. Better come over this way a bit. Hey. Yep. You ready? Yep. The tension's not only on the rope here. I got a bit. Yep. All right, so tell him to get on that throttle. Yo, what was that? Get Ronnie to give it hell. Starting to take him. You're all right. Starting to take him. The combination of Christopher's pushing power and Ron's full throttle pull has freed unhinged Keel. Yeah, he's got him, Luke. Back it up, brother. The yacht rights itself. The risk of the keel cutting through the protected seagrass is high. It's up to Ron to guide unhinged out. We've got a really small corridor in the seagrass that we can use. Hopefully, Ron can see it and drags it through that. Yes. Yes. Holy moly. The yacht, it lives again. That's it. Three times lucky. Wow, what a ripper. Absolute beauty. That's how it's done. Such on the cup. Yeah, that's all that's standard. Woo! You would have done your usual. Bam, boom. He was actually nice and quite gentle today. <laughs> that's Selvage 101. Use what you got, make the rest up as you go. Good job, gang. Woo! Woo! <laughs> well done. Smoked it. Another happy customer, another successful job. The team worked really well today, and we knocked it out in a matter of hours. Cool, buddy. Thank you. Awesome. No problems at all. This is the reason we carry out salvage. It's a hard gig. You don't always get the easiest jobs. There's a lot of pressure to get it right the first time. And everybody thinks that, you know, there's an instruction booklet for this, but there isn't. You know, I just got to fly by the seat of my pants. Lucky I do it well. That's always tough at the top. Job done and another salvage season complete. Yeah, yeah, go, 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 boys. Yeah, team. <laughs> <laughs>